Hello students, welcome to lecture 19 of the online course on nanophotonics, plasmonics and metamaterials. Today's lecture will be on localized surface plasmon resonance or in short LSPR. So here is the lecture outline, we will first see what is localized surface plasmon and then we will see how to uh, do the derivations of localized surface plasmon resonance conditions and we will treat using exact theory of LSPR that is Mi scattering theory or Mi theory. We will also look into the quasi static approximation of LSPR. We will find out how to calculate the scattering and absorption cross section. We will also see how to handle the cases beyond quasi static approximation and towards the end we will see the characteristics of white plasmon and metallic nanoshells. So, let us begin with localized surface plasmon. So, we have seen in the previous lecture the surface plasmon are basically the propagating waves which we call them as SPPs surface plasmon polaritons. These are propagating dispersive electromagnetic waves which are coupled to the electron plasma of a conductor and they are propagated at metal dielectric interface. Now, Localized surface plasmons on the other hand are basically non-propagating that is why they are called localized and they are non-propagating excitations of the conduction electrons on metallic nanostructures which are coupled to the electromagnetic radiation. Now you can look into this particular figure here it shows the illustration of a localized surface plasmon resonance. So this is a tiny metallic nanoparticle and with light falling on it with the electric field oscillating up and down the electron cloud is also getting. So, when the oscillate electric field is in this direction electron cloud is basically pushed downwards. So, that creates a kind of negative charge all the you know electron clouds are pushed downwards. So, there is a kind of negative charge here you can say and there is lack of electrons on the top side. So, you can think of you know some positive charge formation there okay or there are some holes you can say huh? in that case you are able to see some charge separation that is positive and negative so this actually becomes like a dipole and as the electric field changes when the electric field is negative okay you will see the electron clouds are moved upwards in this case so you have the negative charges here and the you know absence of the electrons are felt here which are the positive charges and so the dipole also got reversed. So, that is how with the electric field this metallic nanoparticle gets a induced dipole that also oscillates. Now, with that what happens you might know this fact that oscillating dipole radiates. Now, in this particular case this metallic nanoparticles they also behave like dipoles which are oscillating with incident electromagnetic field. Now, you can analyze this problem using a scattering problem of a small sub wavelength size nanoparticle in an oscillating electromagnetic field. Now, in this particular case it is important to remember that the curved surface of the nanoparticle exerts the restoring force on the driving or on the driven electrons. So, that you know they are pulled back and that that is how this oscillation will start they kind of oval like a piece of jelly. So, if you put a bulk of jelly on the table and try to poke it with a finger or a spoon you will see that the jelly is kind of oobling. The similar kind of um, feature is also seen for surface electrons in this case. So, this lead to a field amplification both inside and in the near field zone of this particular uh, particle. So, inside and near field of the particles will get some kind of you know amplification of the electromagnetic fields and that is what will give rise to resonance. So, when this natural frequency of oscillation of the electrons matches the frequency of the incident field there is a resonance that means those na metallic nanoparticles are able to strongly absorb or scatter light much larger than their geometrical cross section 
and that is the phenomena of resonance and we call that resonance as localized surface plasmon resonance or you can say plasmon resonance right so here what is the good thing as compared to the case of spps that here you do not need to worry about the phase matching condition so you can simply shine light and excite the plasmons so localized surface plasmons can be excited by direct illumination okay so the physics of localized surface plasmon will be explored in this particular lecture by considering the interaction interaction of the metallic nanoparticles with electromagnetic waves and we will see how do we get to the resonance condition okay we will also see the damping process because whenever there is a resonator there are some damping associated okay that decides basically the q factor of the resonator so we will see how this damping process depends on the nanoparticle different sizes and shapes and how the interaction between the particles in an ensemble or in large assembly they actually affect this resonance so along with that we will also see um, what are the other structures other than say uh, solid nanoparticles that support this kind of resonance so we will see that the dielectric inclusion in metallic bodies or you can say that a void in a metallic surface that can also support this kind of localized surface plasmon resonance and also nano shells they can also support so we'll also look into this particular cases now when you look for uh, surface plasmon resonance the plasmonic materials which are considered are basically gold and silver nanoparticles because they are also particularly interesting because their resonance falls in the visible range of the electromagnetic spectrum so that gives you direct you know um, you, you can see directly that you know the particles are able to transmit and reflect uh, bright colors and they are basically coming from absorption and scattering which are enhanced because of the uh, resonance and this effect has been found several um, years back maybe hundreds of years back you can see like the gothic stained glass in notre dame de paris so they are all these beautiful and bright colors are basically coming from uh, gold or silver nanoparticles embedded into the glass so while making they used to make mix this metal to get this bright colors these are basically the colors coming out from the resonance of the nanoparticles similarly the lycurgus cup this cup uh, looks different in color when it is illuminated from outside it shows it looks like a green cup okay but when the light source is inside okay that is the case when you actually see the uh, light that is what is not absorbed is basically coming towards you so in that case from the white light source that is kept at the back of the cup if you remove the plasmonic resonance that is at blue green you will see that the only red light is coming out towards you so you will be seeing the cup as a red cup when the light source is behind but when the light source is in the front you just see the scattering and the scattering resonance is at the blue green or simply green so the cup appears green in color so it's the same cup but it looks different because of this plasmonic properties now when we um, think of calculating lspr we need to first see is there any exact method of calculating uh, the scattering and um, absorption from this uh, particles nanoparticles so the solution comes from the me theory so in 1908 the scientist ghost of me he was able to uh, find an exact theory that can give explanation to the colors of different colloidal solutions of nanoparticles of different sizes so there was an experiment where you know people made colloids of different size of nano gold and silver nanoparticles and all of them look different in color so there has to be some relationship between the size of the particles with the wavelength and the color they strongly scatter or reflect so that theory was known as me theory 
and how it works this works from the concept that Maxwell's equations are linear. So, you can think of a total field you know, that is a kind of summation of the plane wave excitation plus the outgoing wave that is the scattered wave plus the standing wave that is the wave inside that particular particle or void. So, ghost of me actually um, did the solution for spherical particles. So, on spherical coordinate systems he was able to solve the coefficients for each of the wave by matching the boundary conditions and he was able to find out the exact calculation of the scattering and absorption cross section by these particles. Now, how it works let me I will not go into the complete mathematical description of uh, me theory. This can be found in this particular reference the second reference as you see here Boren Hoffman book. Okay. Um, so, in this particular book scattering absorption and scattering of light by small particles you can actually see the complete derivation of me theory. So, I am just showing the important formula here the, that will help you understand how this particular theory is derived and it is working. So, time harmonic scalar wave equation we can write it. So, what is psi? Psi is basically the electric potential it is function of r here. So, this is the uh, wave equation del square plus k square okay, times psi r equals 0. Now, electric and magnetic field if you express them as linear combinations of the vector harmonics m and n you can write m equals grad cross r psi and n equals 1 over k Karloff m. Okay. So, these are kind of uh, some relations with electric and magnetic field, but then if you try to use this particular equation for a spherical coordinates or a particle or a particle with spherical symmetry like a sphere or narrow sphere okay you can actually write down this in terms of spherical coordinates so you have r theta and phi coordinates right so now you are also able to write down your psi that is the electric potential in terms of r theta phi as three different variables so you can separate these variables and say that this is basically r of r theta of theta and phi of phi okay so these are the three variables and you can actually write down the equation now in this particular form so from here to here by assuming that psi r theta phi is basically this function now if if you solve it only for the phi equation you get phi equals e to the power plus minus i m small phi Okay. You can solve it for the theta equation, you will come up the theta is basically associated Legendre polynomial. And when you solve it for the r function that is the radius function, this is how it looks like and r turns out to be square root of 2 by pi z l k r where z l represents spherical Bessel function. And in this particular equation you will see that you will require j l that is basically uh, spherical Bessel function of the first kind which is finite at r equals 0 and for rectangular waves you can use it for incident and uh, internal cases. Also for the scattered waves you can think of spherical Henkel function which is given as small h l. So, what is the speciality of this function? It can be written in the form of e to the power i k r over r where r tends to as r tends to infinity. Okay. So, you can understand that this scattered wave at infinity will die down it will go to 0. So, with that you are able to express e and h of the incident field using the two vector harmonics m and n that you have seen here. Okay. So, you are writing them as a linear combination of these two vector harmonics. So, H incident and E incident are the incident electric and magnetic fields. Now, then you apply the conditions like for a plane wave with incident angle theta equals 0, all the terms will vanish except for m equals 1. So, that gives you a simplified version. You can find out what is A L 1 
that term comes out to be like this and BL1 is basically IAL1. How does it help you? You can actually use this similar kind of expression for scattered and the internal field. So, scattered field is also represented as you know combination of the vector harmonics. Okay. Similarly, internal fields are also written like this. I am not going into the description, but what happens after you find out the incident field, the internal field and the scattered field, you can apply the boundary conditions now. So, the boundary conditions say that the tangential component of the electric field and the magnetic field are continuous across the sphere boundary. So, if you consider the radius to be A, you can write that E incident plus E scattered minus E internal uh, cross R cap equals 0. Similarly, H incident plus H scattered minus H internal cross product with R cap. So, there is the curl okay, is also 0. So, this is how you can actually, this curl is actually giving you what? It is giving you the tangential components. Okay? So, they become 0. Now, you can write down, you know, mu coefficients as a, you know, size independent. So, x equals k naught a. Okay? So, a is the radius. So, x is actually containing the information of the radius as well as the wavelength of the incident light. And you can find out all this coefficient A L, B L, C L, D L and that helps you to actually compute all these particular fields. So, what are, what are the fields? Internal field and external field or scattered field you can find out from this calculations. So, from this you are also able to find out the amount of scattered light, amount of um, what is not scattered is basically absorbed. So, those kind of things you can find out exactly for a spherical symmetry. Okay? So, for spherical particles, me theory provides exact solution. Now, this is what we have been looking so far. So, if you think of plasmon as an overall picture, we have seen bulk plasmon, surface plasmon and then particle plasmon. We have seen that for the bulk plasmon, the condition was that epsilon m omega should be equal to 0. So, that is where the permittivity of that metal becomes 0. So, this is the boundary and that happens at plasma frequency omega p. Okay? And um, the value is square root of n e square over m epsilon naught. So, here you can see all this n is the electron concentration, e is the electronic charge, m is the mass of electron and epsilon naught is the permittivity vacuum. Okay? So, all these parameters are basically fixed. So, plasma frequency, bulk plasma frequency is also not tunable. Whereas, you can go to surface plasmons and this is the condition. We have seen that uh, epsilon omega m omega plus epsilon d equals 0. So, the condition is basically epsilon m omega equals minus epsilon d. So, where they are matching, you are able to excite surface plasmon resonance. And here, the surface plasma frequency actually becomes omega sp over. So, that is omega sp is equal omega p over square root of 1 plus epsilon d. So, you can reduce the frequency when you go to surface plasmon. So, our aim would be here to find out what is the resonance condition for uh, particle plasmon or localized surface plasmons and then what will be the surface plasma frequency in this case. So, let us look into a much more simplified uh, approximation uh, to me theory that is basically quasi static approximation. Now, what is quasi static approximation? The name itself suggests it is quasi static. So, for very small particles when I say very small the radius of the particle is much much smaller than the wavelength. Okay? We can say that the phase of the harmonically oscillating electromagnetic field is practically constant over the particle volume because the particle is very small. Okay? So, in that case instead of electrodynamics you are able to use the electrostatics. Okay? So, you can actually think of this particular situation that you have a homogeneous isotropic sphere of radius A that is located at origin here. Okay? So, this is the permittivity of the metal, this is the permittivity of the surrounding 
dielectric there is the incident electric field E naught radius is A P is the particular point and this is angle theta ok. So, in this case you can think of Laplace equation. So, del square phi equals 0 and E is nothing but minus grad phi. So, you can solve Laplace equation to find out the potential in and outside the particle. So, here also due to azimuthal symmetry you can ignore the phi dependency and you can simply take uh, de the dependency of r and theta. So, again the potential can be you know split into variables like r of r theta of theta and then you solve the theta equation it gives you again the legendary polynomial. So, theta equals p l cos theta and when you solve the r equation you get r equals small r to the power l or r to the power minus l plus 1. So, in that way you are also able to write down what is the potential inside that is phi in that is inside the sphere and also phi out that is outside the sphere. So, these are the two expressions from this equations that tells you what is the potential inside and outside the sphere. So, these are the new coefficients that you have introduced. Now, there are certain things like phi in should be finite at the origin. Also, when you look at phi out, so phi out when it is too far, okay, it should be same as the incident electric field's potential, okay, assuming that the particle's effect is no longer present at a far distance. So, phi out is E naught z which is nothing but min minus E naught z you can write it as minus E naught r cos theta okay, as r tends to infinity. So, if you apply these two conditions you will be able to find out the coefficients. So, you will be able to find out what is B 1. Okay. So, B 1 equals minus E naught and B L equals 0 for all other cases when L is not equal to 1. Okay. So, in that case you are able to find out one coefficient that is B 1. How about A 1 and C 1? Okay. So, here also you can say that the tangential components of the electric fields are continuous. That means, C L equals A L equals 0 for all the cases L is not equals 1. So, let us take the tangential components. So, minus 1 over A dou phi n over dou theta at R equals A that is at this point for inside potential and outside potential they should be same. So, that gives you this kind of a equation. What is the other case that the normal component of the electric field is also continuous. Here in quasi static approximation the electric field magnetic field does not come into the picture. So, we will be considering about the flux. So, the normal component of the flux will also be continuous. So, you can find out what is the flux here minus epsilon naught epsilon m and then you have the this one which is E basically dou phi in over dou r and you are calculating at this boundary. So, that is r equals a. Similarly, you can put it for this one outside region this one. So, this gives you this particular expression. So, you have two variables a 1 and c 1 and you have got two equations now. You solve for it and you can get what are the coefficients a 1 and c 1. The mathematics is looking bit messy, but it is not that complicated. If you are interested, you can always try this on your own. Else, you can simply take these coefficients from this slide that B1 is minus E0, A1 is minus 3 epsilon d over epsilon m plus 2 epsilon d times E0, and C1 is basically epsilon m minus epsilon d over epsilon m plus 2 epsilon d times E0. So, you have got all three coefficients a 1, b 1 and c 1. So, now you are in a position to write down what is the electric potential inside and outside the particle. So, phi in is having a 1 coefficient, phi out has got b 1 and c 1 coefficient. So, you can put those here and this is how it looks like. So, this is the potential inside the particle and this is the potential that is outside the particle. Now, there is something interesting in this particular expression of potential outside the particle. So, if you see there is a distinct 
contribution coming from the electric field which is the incident electric field that is fine. And then there is an extra component that is coming into the picture from the particles point of view. So, if you look here, so this looks like there is a dipole and there is a potential because of this dipole. So, you can actually think of a dipole with a polarizability P which is given by this expression. So, this term you can take as P dot R over 4 pi epsilon naught epsilon d R cube. So, when you equate this to you will get that P equals this is the expression and this can be written as and this polarization is proportional to the electric field. So, that constant okay, you can take as polarizability alpha. So, alpha is the term 4 pi 4 pi a cube then this one epsilon m minus epsilon d over epsilon m plus 2 epsilon d. So, if you this can be written as 3 v that is the volume of the particle. So, what is the volume v of this particle 4 pi by 3 a cube. So, 4 pi a cube can be written as 3 v. So, this is basically the polarizability alpha of the particle. Now, with this particular expression you can find out what is the resonance condition. So, you can see that the polarizability will experience a resonant resonant um, announcement when the condition that the denominator of this is very small. That means, when modulus of epsilon m plus 2 epsilon d is very small. So, you can now epsilon m is basically a complex right because it is a uh, metal. So, metal in visible wavelength typically they have complex permittivity. So, in this condition and what is epsilon d that is basically the dielectric one which is a real real number. So, you can think of this as real of epsilon m omega plus 2 epsilon d will be equal to 0. So, this is a condition for the resonance and it is also known as Froelich condition or Froelich condition. Okay. So, you can understand that this is the resonance condition. Now, if you consider the metal to be a root kind of metal. So, epsilon m equals 1 minus omega p square over omega square plus i gamma omega where gamma is the damping constant and if you try to plot the modulus of this polarizability over a normalized frequency, the frequency is omega omega over omega p here. Okay. In that case, if you take gamma equals 0, okay, that, that you will give you a you know infinite because then this term becomes 0 completely. So, you will get a asymptote, it is going up infinitely, but if you consider some finite value of gamma, then you will get this 0 for gamma equals 0 0.07 omega p, you will get this blue curve, 0 0.1 omega p, you will get this curve and 0 0.2 omega p, you will get this curve. So, what you can see as, is that as gamma that is the damping getting increased, the Q factor of the resonance decreases, the resonance position more or less remains same, but the width of the peaks are getting broader. So, that is what is more damped. Okay. So, now coming back to this slide to fill this uh, vacant spot. So, the condition now we have derived that epsilon m omega sh should be equal to minus 2 epsilon d for resonance or you can say epsilon m omega plus 2 epsilon d equals 0 and LSPR frequency is nothing but omega p over square root of 1 plus 2 epsilon d. Okay? So, this is how the resonance frequencies have shifted from bulk to surface to particle plus bonds. Now, coming back to the point that oscillating dipoles radiate. So, you can actually find out the electromagnetic field which is associ associated with an oscillating electro electric dipole. Okay. So, this is the exact calculation, this is not within uh, quasi static approximation, this is the exact theory. So, you can see that H is nothing but uh, this is the expression for H, what is N, N is the unit vector in the direction of the point of interest and P is the uh, dipole moment of that particular dipole. So, this two 
gives you the expression for E, e and H. Okay. So, from this you can see that in the near field, the fields are pro, pro, pre, or you can say predominantly electric because in the near field regime you will get mainly electric fields and in the radiation zone that is when k r is much much greater than 1 okay the fields are of the spherical waveform so this from this particular ones if you uh, put this two conditions so in the near zone k r is much much lesser than 1 in radiation zone k r is much much greater than 1 you can find out that the field in near field is mainly electric whereas in the radiation zone or the far field zone they are of the spherical waveform okay now coming back to the quasi static we have seen that we are able to obtain alpha that is the polarizability of a uh, particle now what do we do with that we are able to find out the scattering and absorption cross section using these two simple formulas so scattering cross section will be k to the power 4 over 6 pi modulus of alpha square and C A B S that is the cross section of absorption will be k imaginary of alpha. Now, if you see the values here, scattering is proportional to a to the power 6 and absorption is proportional to a cube. So, you can understand that for small particles absorption dominate over scattering but as the particle size increases scattering quickly gains and then it becomes the major contributing factor okay and extinction cross section is nothing but the summation of the scattering and absorption so extinction means whatever is the amount of light getting lost or extinct so these are the two observations from this particular formula fine so you can also uh, write down like this like if you take a sphere of volume v which has got a metal permittivity epsilon given as epsilon 1 plus i epsilon 2 within the quasi static limit you can write a simplified formula for scattering cross section as 9 omega over c epsilon m to the power 3 by 2 times v and then this particular ratio so epsilon 2 is basically the imaginary part of the metal permittivity and epsilon 1 is the real part of the metal permittivity. So, you can also find out what is the resonance here. So, again if you look into the plot, so this is basically extinction spectra of a uh, 50 nanometer gold nanosphere. So, what is the difference here? So, the black curve is when the surrounding media is air. Okay? In this case, epsilon m is the surrounding media okay so it's not metal it's here it is surrounding media is um, epsilon m so if you put epsilon m equals 1 you will get this particular graph from this equation and then red one is water and n is the refractive index that is 1.33 so epsilon m will be square of 1.33 that is 1. 1.69 I believe and then the last one is for silica that is n equals 1.5 so epsilon m in this case will be 2.25 so this is what we can see that you are able to do the refractive index sensing using this kind of uh, gold nanosphere because the resonance peak position is getting changed so as the dielectric Okay, so there is a bit of uh, yeah this this should be D okay or you can say this is medium I will correct this later on. So this is basically uh, epsilon D okay you can say it is a dielectric or you can also say this is the medium okay. So when epsilon D increases uh, the resonance frequency is also from here to here the resonance frequency actually increased yeah no sorry the wavelength actually increased it means the resonance frequency actually decreased and your cross section of extinction actually increases so once again this is in terms of wavelength 
so wavelength is increasing means it is getting red shifted that means the energy is getting reduced you can also apply quasi static approximation for non spherical particles something like um, nano rod or nano ellipsoid so in that case you can have uh, three particular axes so you can consider this particular case is an ellipsoid so it will have three um, axes a1 a2 and a3 these are basically the semi axis so this is how the equations are correlated so you can find out polarizability in different directions okay for the three cases so if you consider the cross section to be same and only the length to be different so there will be two different cases so which are shown here so you can also have longitudinal excitation or transverse excitation of the uh, electrons on the surface of such nanoparticles depending on their um, incident electric field polarization so the light is falling from the top it has got a horizontal electric field okay like this so the electrons will also oscillate along the length of the nano rod okay so this is a nano rod or nano ellipsoid okay and you will get one particular kind of polarizability but when the electric field is coming from this direction sorry the light is coming from this direction with this electric field oscillating in this direction up and down like this then the polarizability will be different so alpha i gives you the polarizability along the three direction which has got a geometrical factor li in this particular equation and li can be obtained from here so as you can see this is a generic case for a sphere l1 l2 and l3 are same one third because summation of li should be equal to one so with this you are able to find out the polarizability of an ellipsoid and if you plot the absorbance versus wavelength you will see that for the two cases okay so if you change the aspect ratio that is the ratio of the height over the diameter of this okay so as you change the aspect ratio there is a large shift of the resonance first observable thing is that in such a particle there are basically two resonance peak so one resonance this particular resonance peak corresponds to the surface plus one resonance along the length of the nano rod whereas this one is along the transverse direction so this is called transverse dipolar resonance this is called longitudinal dipolar resonance and when you increase the aspect ratio of the particle you see that the transverse peak does not shift that significantly whereas the peak of the longitudinal plus bond undergoes much more red shift that shift means shift towards longer wavelength what happens to the energy energy reduces okay now quasi static approximation is it good throughout no for very very tiny particles or very very large particles it is a problem so let's look into the case of first very large particles where the particle size is more than 100 nanometer so in those cases you should go for me theory because they provide you an exact solution in form of power series expansion and quasi static are basically the only the first order terms from that expression okay but however for you know quasi static to little larger particles you can actually add some extra terms like you know you can add some effects coming from redshift due to retardation okay then broadening due to radiative decay and some higher order resonance you can add those terms to make your um, quasi static approximation little bit more accurate but always remember for spherical particles me theory provides you the exact solution so this is what we have seen that if you start from 50 nanometer where this is the size of the particle your quasi static approximation is pretty good but slowly as you move towards larger particle up to here 100 nanometer 
okay we'll see that there is a red shift there is a spectral broadening so these are the effects that comes into picture so there will be radiative decay that gives you um, spectral broadening there is also red shift due to retardation because when the particle becomes large the initial approximation that the electric field over the particle volume does not change significantly that does not hold good so there will be a phase lag between the you know electron movement from one end on the other end of the particle because the particle size is large so all these effects will be considered and they will try to make your quasi static theory more inaccurate when you try to go to larger particles here is an approx uh, figure that shows you that with the size of the particle and change in the permittivity how the resonance wavelength is going to change and here is the damping pathways for uh, particle plus one means there are two types of decay one is by the radiative decay the name itself tells you that there is a radiation through which the decay takes place so you will get a photon out of it the other damping may be because of the non-radiative factors that is it is getting absorbed okay and this is this can be of two two types like it can be interband from one band from the d band to sp band if you go and or it can be also intraband so within the same band you are moving from a uh, lower to higher energy level okay so that kind of transition also can give you damping in this particular particles so overall you will be able to get broadening because of this now if you come to the other end like if you go to extremely small particles which are less than 10 nanometer in size then also there is a problem like usually for particles which are smaller than the electron min free, min free path in a metal say in gold the min free path is 42 nanometer so one it means an electron can travel up to 40 or 42 nanometer without colliding with another electron now if the particle itself is smaller than 42 nanometer what will happen before the electrons get collided with another electrons they will actually hit the boundary of the particle and that will actually give you additional damping okay so these are called you know additional damping coming from reduced mean free path and that can be also empirically at, at associated with some broadening with and there is some simple formula that can correlate the damping constant gamma with the actual damping constant plus a is a constant which is usually taken as one for isotropic cases vf is the fermi velocity and r is the radius or the reduced distance of the collision if you are thinking of a thin film or a thin shell you can take that shell dimension or thin film dimension as this r and that will give you some additional damping and that you can put it back into the root formula to get what will happen to this particular resonance so here is an um, calculation of such uh, line width and dephasing time versus uh, resonance energy and this has been done for um, gold as well as silver and is, is, as you can see that this line is basically me theory and uh, for the particles which are you know smaller like 40 nanometer 60 nanometer they are very much lying on the me theory similarly you can also see from here okay for extremely small particles that is where the radius becomes one nanometer or so that is where you have to remember that the classic electromagnetic theory will no longer hold good so you have to go for quantum mechanics to solve it so there the energy gained by individual electrons per incident photon excitation can be written as delta e which is h cross nu over n and that should be greater than or equal to kbt and n is what n is the absolute number of electrons in that particular particle fine so with that we understood that there are particle plus bonds which are tunable and what are the different damping mechanisms for this and there is another sort of plus bond that is also possible which is called void plus bond 
so void means if you take a sheet of metal and make a hole out of it there also you will see that when there is a light incident on this they will if the hole is sub wavelength you are able to excite um, you know electron clouds to move on one side so you'll get positive on the other side so th this behaves like a you know source of uh, plasmon so in this case you sub you swap epsilon m and epsilon d so this is the metal this is the dielectric permittivity if you swap this in the metal sphere dipole moment what you got in the previous one you get this so in this case the froelich condition of the resonance also will get changed so it becomes epsilon d plus 2 epsilon m equals 0 or you can write epsilon m omega equals minus epsilon d over 2 that means you can also find out what is the resonance frequency that comes out to be square root of 2 by 3 omega p that is the resonance frequency for void plasmons are also different also there are two cases like this the sphere plasmon that you have seen where it is uh, omega b that is the bulk or you can say omega p that is the plasma frequency of the bulk metal over square root of 3 here it is different okay there is an additional factor of square root of 2 coming into the picture now there are po there are two possible hybridized modes for these two things to come together and create a shell so this is called a nano shell so in nano shell there are possibilities that they are in the anti bonding kind of orientation so where the outside dipole and the inner dipole are in the opposite direction or you can also have this case where the outside dipole so you can see the outside layer plus plus charges then out this side also there are negative charges they create one dipole towards the inner side you will also have another dipole plus and minus so here both the dipoles are in the same orientation so the overall energy is lowered okay and um, this is called bonding type of interaction and this is called anti bonding type of interaction so in this case in this particular two um, cases you will have two hybridized modes the resonance frequency of these modes are given as omega plus minus okay so this is how it is obtained so you have 1 plus minus 1 over 2 l plus 1 square root of so you can take l equal to 1 and find out what is the first order okay uh, anti bonding mode and bonding mode for this particular cases so they are also tunable because you can change the metal you can change the shell thickness and you can also get a lot of tunability out of this void plasmons okay or you can say nano shells void plasmons are this one you can nano shells if you remember from the initial lectures they were the ones having the largest tunability so depending on your application you are able to design nano shells that can give you you know that particular uh, resonance at that particular operating wavelength okay so with that we'll stop here today and uh, in the next lecture we'll go into a little bit of more details of this resonance effects and if you have got any queries regarding to this lecture you can always drop me an email at this particular email address mentioning MOOC on the subject line thank you mm -hmm.